Hello and welcome everybody to another Tuesday afternoon program with the Genealogy Center. I am very excited to have all of you here today to hear from Dr. Juanita Gaston, uh, who will be giving us this wonderful presentation, All Shakespeare's Are Not From England, Researching an African-American Family from Leon County, Florida. So I am super excited to have Juanita here today. Dr. Juanita Gaston, who is a professional genealogist and teacher specializing in African-American research. She was inspired by Alex Haley's roots and she began researching her own family in the 1970s. After working as a college professor of geography for over 30 years, she retired from Florida A&M University and started providing geological services to other people. So she's a member of APG, NGS, AAHGS, and several other state and local societies. So she has a phenomenal background, and I am very excited for her presentation. So I'm going to disappear, and I'll put links to all those important things in the chat. Well, I'm happy to be here today in observance of June 10th. I'm going to stop my video and just talk to you. So in observance of June 10th, June 19th, 1865, we are here today celebrating Juneteenth. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a family from Leon County, Florida, the Shakespeare's, and I'm going to place them in historical context and show you the documents that I use to tell their story. So uh, again, I'm happy to be here. Um, we celebrate, uh, of course, June 19th is a federal holiday, but here in Leon County, we celebrate May 20th as well as um, Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, for that is the day when, uh, the, when General McCook arrived in Leon County, Tallahassee at the Knott House and notified everyone in Middle Florida and Southern Georgia that um, uh, enslaved people were free. So today is in honor of June 19th. My presentation is in honor of June 19th and May 20th. What I would like to share today is the untold story of Edmund Shakespeare's family of Leon County, Florida. Uh, this is not a step-by-step -step guide on how to trace your African-American family back into slavery. Rather, its purpose is to illustrate the number of historical documents that are available today for you to trace your family. And um, it's very important that even if you know very little about your family, I hope this presentation will inspire you not to become disappointed, but to go ahead and trace your family. Because as you will see here, this um, uh, the descendants of Edmund Shakespeare knew very little about his family. And I'll share that with you a moment. But with historical documents, I will show how he and his family transformed their lives from being bond servants, as some historians call them, to free people. So this is the story of his family becoming landowners, educators, political activists in Leon County, Florida, the seat of slavery in Mill, Florida and Southern Georgia. What's interesting about Edmund Shakespeare's story is that it was unknown to his descendants. So you may ask the question, then what prompted the study of the Shakespeare family? In a 2015 genealogy meeting, one of his descendants mentioned that she knew absolutely nothing about the Shakespeare, her Shakespeare family. And of course, the name Shakespeare really caught my interest. And I began working with her. And that, and within a year, we had uncovered a lot of his story, a lot of the family story. And I have to say that the, the story continues because um, I did this originally in 2015, but now I'm uncovering a lot more information on the family, the family, the Galpin family, uh, whom the Shakespeare family were enslaved, um, were very famous in South Carolina, and uh, uh, several books have been written about them. And so the goal is to tie the Shakespeare family, my future research is to tie the Shakespeare family into the Galpin family in South Carolina. 
So what was known about the Shakespeare family? Very little. My friend's mother, na mother's name was Gracie Jane Shakespeare Brown. The name of Gracie Jane's father was Samuel Shakespeare. The name of Samuel's sister was Gracie Shakespeare, Grace Shakespeare, sometimes called Gracie. The family always lived in Bel Air. They always owned property there. They held from South Carolina. And as you know, with genealogists, we always say, go check out your home sources, talk to your older relatives. Well, in this case, my friend did not have any home sources and she was the elder of the family. So we had no one to turn to, to ask questions. And we had no, um, no records to begin with other than, of course, we could, we, the death certificate of her mother who died in 19, in the 1960s, I believe. So with reasonably exhaustive research, um, uh, reasonably exhaustive research reveals various records illuminating the life of Shakespeare and his family. Ancestors and relatives were in city directories. They were in local newspapers. They were in periodicals. Uh, they were in property records, wills on the Florida um, voter registration roll in 1867 in the U.S. Freedman Bank records, in U the Freedman Bureau records, and in letters of the slaveholders family. So from these primary and secondary documents, which I'll share later, Edmund Shakespeare's, Edmund Shakespeare's story was pieced together. He was a farmer, a carpenter, an educator, and a civic leader. In addition, his, family, his children were skilled laborers, landowners, educators, and civic leaders. So this is the untold story of Edmund Shakespeare. I will begin the story on May 20th, 1865, and go forward to about um, to, to, um, Edmund's death in 1890. So I'll go forward to about 1900. Then I'll flash back into slavery and tell his story, uh, share the information we found on him in slavery dating as early as the 1850s. So when, when freedom arrived in Leon County, Florida, Edmund was about 47 years old. He was a farmer, he was a house carpenter. He, um, he uh, I think he may have lived with the family uh, as opposed to being a, a as well as, as opposed to being a field hand. So he was um, in the home. A lot of the letters was, will uh, show that as we move forward. Based on when his oldest known child was born, he may have been in Mill, Florida since the 1840s. Since a slave person did not migrate alone, he most likely came with some early South Carolina settlers that migrated to the area to raise cotton. Uh, during the 1840s, not only did settlers come from South Carolina, but they came from Virginia, they came from North Carolina, they came from Maryland because Florida was just opening up its lands to settlers and, and the old settlers were moving from the depleted soils, lands in Maryland, Virginia, moving to uh, middle Florida. According to historian Titus Brown, on 20 May, local African Americans were summoned to a flag raising ceremony to the Capitol and were informed that their bondage was over. The pageantry of the event included a 200 gun salute to the long absent national flag. Edmund Shakespeare and his family lived less than five miles from the event, so it is likely that he or a member of his family and a member of the slaveholders' family, Dr. George Galfin, Galfin, were present at the event. It is conceivable that Edmund may have driven the Galfins to the event. He worked in the household. He was a house carpenter. He was literate, and he was favorite. He was a favorite, a family member, as you will see later. He was assigned to the, um, okay, I've just said that. So he was affectionately, affectionately mentioned in correspondence between family members. So 
uh, I believe that he could have easily driven him, or not driven him, but uh, uh, carried him to the courthouse. Now, before we talk about Edmund, uh, let's take a look at the setting, Leon County, Florida, Middle Florida, as it was called. Until emancipation, Leon County was the center of Florida slave trade. It had more people enslaved than any other county in Florida. It was the wealthiest county in Florida and Southern Georgia. And in the table below, you get a sense of the population. 1830, uh, Blacks were, uh, enslaved persons were 48% of the population. By 1860, enslaved persons were 73% of the population at 9,000. And there were a uh, few free people here about 60 in 1860. So you get a sense of the importance of Leon County. Now, as we look at Leon County, I have a map here showing you the location of the plantations. Uh, in the northern part here, this is where you found a lot of the fertile soils here. And this is the area that attracted the oldest of uh, the settlers from South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. Um, so they opened the plantations up with slave labor and some had 5,000, 8,000 acres in this area here. Now, um, Edmund, Edmund Shakespeare and his slaveholder, Dr. Galvin lived down here around 79 in an area we call Bel Air. And I'll talk about Bel Air in a moment. And so all of the slave, you see the 81 lead, large plantations within Leon County. Galvin had a relatively small uh, plantation according to his numbers. He had about a thousand acres. 300 of those acres were down here in Bel Air. And I'm not quite sure where the other 900 acres were, uh, most likely up here in uh, Northern Leon County. What about Bel Air? Bel Air is very interesting in itself. It's in Southern Leon County. It's a community established in about 1840, partly as a resort and a refuge from malaria and yellow fever outbreaks that occurred in the summer. The wealthy Leon County planters had summer homes in Bel Air. While their plantations were in the northern part of the county, as I've shown you on the map, and I've already talked about Dr. Galvin's 300 acres in Bel Air. What about uh, Dr. Galvin? He was born in South Carolina in about 1811. He arrived in Leon County sometime before 1838, for he was on the 1840 census in Leon County. He arrived with 12 enslaved persons. By 1860, he had about 60 enslaved persons and real estate valued at $14,000 and a personal estate valued at $30,000, according to the U.S. Census. He died in Bel Air in August 1861 for, we know that is great information. Uh, and later you will see his will. And later I will show you his inventory of estate mentioned in some of Edmund Shakespeare's family. So it was here in Bel Air that we found Edmund Shakespeare in 1866. We don't have any records. Uh, we, have, we have records of Edmund dated in the 1850s as an enslaved person. Uh, but we'll begin here at emancipation and we'll go forward. Then later we'll double back to the 1850s and I'll show you letters and the will and uh, the inventory. Uh, that shows Emma Shakespeare and his family. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, of course, were very important during this time period. Um, they affected about 4 million enslaved persons, and of course, uh, the lives of 4 million people were radically changed. Uh, as you know, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery the 14th Amendment granted citizenship and the right to own property, and the 15th Amendment granted men over 21 the right to vote. And uh, 
with the passage of these amendments, we see Edmund, you will see Edmund and his sons exercising their rights as citizens of the US in the next slides, that's uh, in a few slides um, soon. Now, uh, what happened to Bel Air after emancipation? Uh, a lot of the freedmen uh, in Tallahassee remain as tenants or laborers on the land they had tended before. Uh, but in Bel Air, some of the planters began abandoning their lands. The Galfins eventually moved to Jacksonville and other points. Uh, so a lot of the planters left the area and also some uh, wealthy um, uh, folks from the north came into northern Leon County and bought up hunting, created hunting plantations. So where was, um, what was the first record we encountered Edmund Shakespeare? The record was dated March 7th, 1866. You notice the date, shortly after, less than a year after emancipation, Edmund Shakespeare purchased 10 acres of land in Bel Air from the George Galpins estate. He purchased the land before the 14th Amendment, which gave him the right to what, own property and so forth. Um, and what's really interesting about this, about the deed, is that not only did he purchase land in Bel Air, but he purchased, in the deed it said, he purchased the residence of Dr. George Galvin, where he was, uh, worked in, was a carpenter, and his family, tended the family nurses and caretakers of the family. He purchased that home less than a year after emancipation. All right, so we have that. So this is the deed, 1866. I transcribed it and I'll just read part of it. Um, this indenture made the seventh day of March in the year of our Lord, 1866, John Maxwell Galpin, that is the son of, of um, George Galton, of the first and Edmund Shakespeare of the second part. Uh, I won't read all of it, but paid the sum, Edmund paid the sum of $250 for 10 acres of land, better known as the, resi better known as the residency of the late George Galton in Bel Air. And it gave the description of the land. I'll show you a map in a little bit showing you the approximate area of the land, okay? But uh, just think about that. In 1866, um, Edmund Shakespeare bought 10 acres in Bel Air for $250. And okay, this is a map, um, I'll explain it. Um, this map here, this part here, shows you the city of Tallahassee. And down here, the green represents part of the land that um, uh, George Galfin owned. The red is the land that uh, either, I can't read it, Edmund. Edmund owned the red, 10 acres there. And his son, um, um, Abram or Abraham, had another 10 acres that he bought in 1868. And um, Abraham uh, bought, the, bought the property from a relative of the Galfins for $150. All right, so on this map here to the uh, left, this is a map, a plat map of Leon County. And they were in section 19, so we plotted close up the area that uh, seemed to have been Galfin's, era, Galfin's farm, uh, the area where um, Edmund bought his property, the, Edmund, the, prop, the area where the son, Abraham, bought his property. And what you can't see here is this is a schoolhouse. This is a schoolhouse, the Bel Air School. And later there was a church in the area called the uh, Bethel Missionary Baptist Church which was um, pastored by Reverend James Page, one of the leading uh, ministers in Florida during, during, the, during slavery, well-known uh, well uh, minister. All right, so moving forward now, uh, we see that they've 
uh, bought property uh, there um, uh, by, 18, by 1867, the 15th Amendment granted uh, men over 20 the right to vote. The federal government, therefore the federal government recognized black men as full American citizens. And so uh, um, for black uh, Floridians listed on the 1867 68 re voter registration rolls, for them it's the earliest time, earliest record where their full name is given. But this is not the case for Edmund, but we already see that he signed a record in 1866 buying property. So as early as 1866. So this is the second record for him where his name is recorded. You may ask me, uh, if I digress here a moment, you may wondering, be wondering, well, the Shakespeare's, were there Shakespeare's in Leon County? White Shakespeare's? No. Uh, there were no white Shakespeare's in Leon County, none in the surrounding middle, in surrounding middle Florida. So we don't know where the name Shakespeare came from. Um, uh, we found um, several members of his family, but uh, we don't know uh, the, the origin of the name. Well, back to the 1867 Florida voter registration rolls. All right, so I have transcribed it. So um, on August 10th, 1867, Edmund Shakespeare, uh, uh, filled out the application to register to vote, okay? He had been in the state 12 months, which was pretty standard information on the Florida roll. And you see up here, there's a little check, check by the name. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a check here by the name. Oops. There was a check here by the name and the check said that they voted. So when they voted, there was a check. So we have a record of, of Edmund Shakespeare voting it, uh, in the 1867, 1868 voter registration rolls. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, they're becoming politically active. Uh, they voted and uh, they continue to vote and to become involved in the politics within Leon County and in the state of Florida. The Shakespeare's were Republicans, and uh, one record we have of Edmund Shakespeare, I believe this is the father, uh, was the recording secretary for this newly formed Hayes Wheeler Club in, 18, in 1876. Uh, that club, Republican club uh, organized in Bel Air. And you see they had 75 persons sign their names as members of the club. And again, Edmund Shakespeare was the treasurer. That's one of the early records of their involvement. They're in the newspapers. There are lots of um, articles about their involvement in politics. Uh, Catherine um, May, uh, Mary May, Catherine has done a book on blacks and political the political arena in Leon County, and they're mentioned in that as well, and also in newspapers. So in this uh, slide here. In uh, 1882, they're still involved in uh, in uh, uh, politics, and uh, Samuel Shakespeare here is appointed an inspector at the upcoming election, federal election, and he he has been appointed an, an inspector for his district 17, which is in the Bel Air region. Also, we have another uh, article here regular Republican ticket where E.M. Shakespeare is, uh, uh, is on the ticket for a member of the assembly for Leon County. The, I, think, I think that's the state assembly. Now E.M. E. M. Shakespeare is the grandson of Edmund Shakespeare. Uh, he was born about 1858, I believe. All right, so as we move from, uh, we're gonna move from the political arena, but there were lots of stories about them at meetings, attending conventions in Centerville, attending conventions in um, Gainesville. Um, those, there were, so those were articles in the newspaper referring to them. 
Now I want to move to uh, some institutions that helped uh, Blacks, formerly enslaved uh, people, to move from slavery to freedom. And now I want to highlight the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bank. Okay, first I'll talk about the Freedmen's Bureau and Edmund Shakespeare's family's involvement here. Okay. So you all, you're probably all familiar with the Freedmen's Bureau, um, the correct name, the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, often referred to as the Freedmen's Bureau, established in March 1865. The Bureau uh, supervised the re re all relief and educational activities relating to refugees and freedmen, including issu issuing rations, clothing, and medicine, and other things, but I'm just highlighting this. All right, so Edmund Shakespeare's family uh, encountered uh, the Freedmen Bureau. In 1868, Edmund applied for rations. He signed a contract with uh, J.S. Maxwell to rent 20 acres of land in 1868 and, and to receive two rations. What's really interesting about this record is that it lists the family members. This is really great. Edmund is age 49, so we calculate his birth year, 1818, 1819. Rachel, his wife at that time, uh, about 1823. Samuel, Abram, Grace, three of the younger children. And we, I have documents to prove that these indeed are the children. I've connected, I've been able to connect through census and other records back to indeed that these are his children and also identified other children as well. All right, so that was the only record we have of, of uh, Edmunds and his family's contact with the Freedmen Bureau. We know that in 1868, he had already bought land, uh, 10 acres, so most likely he needed more land to, you know, raise, uh, uh, raise his crops and be, to be economically productive. All right, so we know that the Freedmen Bureau promoted education and the Shakespeare family were involved in that. In 1870, the Bel Air Free School in Tallahassee, uh, Miss Gracie Shakespeare, the Edmund's daughter, uh, was a pupil there. And not only was Gracie a pupil, but also her brother Samuel, who was a little older, he was a pupil there as well. But in but in one article, the newspaper reported that Miss Gracie Shakespeare was very entertaining in a school program. And with little care and culture, much better things may be expected from this quarter. Okay, so that was uh, an excerpt from the article, a long article in the uh, Tallahassee Sentinel. Um, their involvement in education uh, continued between 1872 and 1875. Reverend James Page and Edmund Shakespeare were teachers at the Bel Air. Free school, according to the Leon County Board of Public Instruction, Instruction Minutes. And in 1947, uh, bringing the family forward to the 20th century, Edna Shakespeare's great granddaughter, Gracie Mae Brown, my, my friend's sister, graduated from the Bel Air School, Free School. And that may have been the last year of that school, I'm not sure. This is not an image of the school, it's just one that I selected to show. All right, so now let's move on to Freeman Bank Records. Freeman Bank Records, this was a gold mine for piecing together the story of Edmund Shakespeare and his family. It was fantastic. So in 2015, uh, so this key record, this was a key record in, in unlocking the Shakespeare family story. The, the Freedman Bank records, I know a lot of you have looked at them. They contain information such as the name of the depositor, the age, height, complexion, occupation, uh, names of brothers and sisters, parents, 
children, where they lived, where they were born. And so this really was a gold mine. It was a gold mine because at least at least six family members had accounts, six or four, but there were about there were six deposits anyway, six deposits by family members. And a couple of people had two deposits. So let me show you what was revealed in these records. One of the first, one of the records was Amy Wright. Now, what's interesting about Amy Wright is that uh, Amy was about fifty years old. Amy was born in Barnwell. Uh, she was born in Augusta, South Carolina, which is Aiken County. She was brought up in Barnwell District. She named her father, Stephen McKinney. She named her mother, Katie Galpin. She spelled it O and the Galpin spelled A. Uh, she, her husband was John Wright. And she, this was on May 8th, 1872. And she signed this in Savannah. And um, what is interesting here, which I don't have on, this, on the, on the um, transcription, is that she named her brother Edmund Shakespeare. She named her brother Edmund Shakespeare. She also named her husband, her children. She also named her children. And so this, um, uh, I was able to extend the line, you know, uh, search to collateral relatives and, and find them as well. Okay. The, uh, let me see if I have the other record by her. Okay, here's another record by Amy Wright. Uh, May 8th, 1872. And so again, okay, is this the same one? Let's see, I wanna make sure I'm not giving you the same one. May 8th, 1872, may have the same one again. Yes, okay, I, I entered the same one twice. I didn't show you the. She had another record where she provided more information. Uh, but I think you can see where we're going with this. All right, so that's Amy. That is, according to her, she is Edmund Shakespeare's sister. In the second um, Freeman Bureau record, she also mentions Edmund as her brother. And in the second record, she tells them where to give the money if she should die to her daughter's child. All right, Abram Shakespeare is also a son of um, Edmund. And look what information he provides. On June 25th, 1870, he has signed it. And he says that he gives his complexion dark brown. Who is his father, Edmund? Who is his mother, Clarissa? Who is his wife, Anika? Where was he born? In Florida? In Bel Air. And he is a carpenter. And he has an interesting note. Um, I think he had grievance with his father because he said his mother and father separated. Father married another woman, separated also. So I don't know if he had any fault with his father. <laughs> but anyway, he names Clarissa as his mother, which is in 1870 is a little suspect. Uh, I don't quite know where to go with that because I found a marriage record of Clarissa and Edmund in 1870-something, so about 1873. So I don't know if this is the woman that he was living with, you know, and he later married her. I don't know. But I thought that was an interesting comment. Okay, Samuel Shakespeare, we saw him, we saw Abram, and we saw Samuel on the rations, right? And so Samuel Shakespeare was, uh, he filled out his application, his, his Freeman Bank application, uh, opened his account on May 19th, 1871. He was 19. His father, you can't read it, but it says Edmund. His father's Edmund. And he was born in Bel Air. He, at this time, he worked on a farm, and he named his brothers. He remarks, his brothers, Abram, we know that. Gracie, we know that. And here we have two additional people, Elsie Jackson and Kathy Osborne. They, tend out, they turn out to be older siblings. 
And we found records to support that. Okay, another record here is Edmund again. Edmund filled out, a, opened an account in Tallahassee and he opened an account in, I think, Savannah as well. So on March the 20th, we have him open another account. He's in Liberty City. I think he's in Jacksonville. He's 19 and he's a carpenter, not married. And here he clearly says his father is Edmund Shakespeare. His mother is Jane and she's dead. His brothers and sisters, Abram, George, Edwin Moses, and Hagar, they're all dead. Okay, and we'll see them later on mentioned in, we see, we'll see some of them mentioned in the letters from the slaveholder, and we may find some of them mentioned in the inventory, um, in the, the, the state uh, inventory. All right, another one, well, we just saw that one, so let me skip that. All right, so we'll fast forward here to 1870. So in 1870, this is very interesting. We already know that he has property, that Edmund has property. So in the 1870 census, he is in Bel Air, Southern Leon County. He is about 51 years old. He is a house carpenter. And look at his, his uh, estate. He has $850 worth of real and $400 worth of personal property. He can read, he can write. And his son, uh, Abram, lives at 145, which is a few doors from Edmund. And, with, and Abram is 27. He's a house carpenter. Look at his value. We know that he, brought, he bought property in Leon County, uh, Jason, to his, near his father. And so his, person, his, his um, estate now is about $700, valued at $700. This is in 1870, of course, five years after emancipation. He can read and write. His wife can't read and write, but he can. And the son, who's 15, works on a farm. All right, so now uh, I've taken you to 1870. There's a lot more I can say about the Shakespeare's being involved in politics and education in Leon County. But right now, what I want to do, because of time, I want to take you back to slavery and show you some of the records that we found to uh, illuminate the life of um, Emma Shakespeare and his family. So we're going to go back into slavery now, and we're going to go to the 1850s, okay? Uh, at the State Archives, Florida State Archives, there's a manuscript collection of letters from um, one of um, George Galfin's daughters, Sally Galfin Burroughs. It's about 10 letters. I've transcribed most of them. So in one letter dated uh, January 31st, 1857, uh, uh, Sally is writing to her brother, uh, uh, J.M. Galfin, who uh, is away. Oh, J.M. is writing to Sally. I'm sorry, I got to be stuck. J.M. is writing to Sally. And he's telling about the new cook, Catherine, who later on I found out was, um, belonged to, her, to the wife's mother, I mean, father, and she inherited him from her father, Park Hill. And Catherine had been laying around up a week or two from a sore finger, okay? Mama Amy, this could be Amy Wright, says, I must give you a thousand thanks for this and says she is very glad you escaped the fire. And she asked about Aunt McKinney, Aunt McKinney's Negro woman, Becky. There's McKinney, the name McKinney. We saw that Amy said her father was Stephen McKinney. We don't know if there's a connection there, but there is a McKinney in the record there. Um, she says that, um, well, that's all she says there, that he says about the family. Mama Amy, okay? And another letter transcribed April 5th, 1857. This is Mary writing to Sally. And now she's referring to, Father may kindly let Edmund work here for use in the seal there, so forth. Okay, those are two letters. And here is, I transcribed several of the letters, so I may, I don't think I have the ones I just mentioned. 
But here on March the 23rd, 1857, we have we have mentioned in the in the letter. This is a letter to Sally from Virginia, her stepmother, and she mentions Grace, Hagar, Amy, Jane. These are Shakespeare people. She mentions Hetty and Catherine. Uh, they're not. I didn't find them in the family. But again, Grace. Hagar, Hagar has measles. Uh, Amy has a cold. Jane is sick. And uh, uh, she has to do all the work because all of the household help is ill. In the second letter, uh, 1857, uh, Bel Air, Brother Max, uh, the, the sister, Brother Max, the sister writes to Brother Max and said, Mom, Amy feels hurt that you thought she did not care for you. She said she didn't think you, you can care for her, but I told her I thought she was mistaken. Hetty, um, Hetty is an interesting character. I don't know who, she, who where, they, where, where she was acquired from, but Hetty, um, this is a side, Hetty, they had a peddler there visiting one night and Hetty went in and stole some linen linen and she was confronted and then she apologized and gave the uh, gave the fabric back to the peddler but Hetty was a little mischievous on in December 1857 we have another letter where I said remember me to all the servants tell mama Amy that I think of her every spare moment to Andrew, Henry, Jane, and Daddy Edmund, and Robert, Tom, John, and Mama Dicey. I don't know. They're not related, but here you have Mama Amy, you have Jane, you have Daddy Edmund mentioned. Okay. And the last letter, February 22nd, 1861, uh, Mac is writing to his sister to say, to Mama Amy, Keep a good heart, and I will soon be home again. Give my love to father, mother, and remember me to all the servants. Well, this is right on the eve of uh, McGal of Galfin's death, and so he's on his way home to manage the property. Uh, but he's telling Mama Amy not to to keep a good heart. He will be there soon, and it is it is um, uh, Brother Mac, J. M. Maxwell. Galfin, whom Edmund buys the property from in 1866. He buys the property from him. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is the will. This is the will. Uh, George died in 1861. This is just a portion of the will, which I'll read here. Um, and in the will, this is typical of many wills you, you've known about seeing. He says, I give, devise, and bequeath all the rest and residual of my estate of every character and description to my beloved wife, Virginia P., and my children whom he names. And he said, my said wife and children to each have one sixth part provided, however, that in the division of my estate, the slave Edmund and his wife, Jane, and their four children this is probably probably Abram, uh, Samuel, Gracie, and maybe Hagar. Hagar, yes. Together with future increases to his wife. Okay. There are some other people mentioned. I'm not quite sure. I think Elsie might be Amy's, Amy Wright's daughter, but I'm not sure. I transcribed this letter January 14th, 2016. This will, rather, this will. All right, so the last record here we have is the the state. So George Galfin died in maybe June, July, and his state went into probate in August. And so um, this is just a partial list of the inventory. And um, the children, uh, I mean, the people along with property, with cow and household goods all listed together. 
And in this case, I just want to highlight uh, the organization of the inventory. It seems like they're in family groups. Um, here is Edmund, here is Elsie with two young children, so we believe this is her family group. Uh, Susan there uh, alone, uh, she's, her name hasn't come up anywhere in Edmund's family, so I'm not quite sure where she belongs in the lineup. Maybe she's just independent. But here is um, Edmund, age 43, and his value. He's valued at $1,800, probably one of the highest valued persons here. Here's Jane, she's 30, $800. Uh, here's Samuel's 10, about $600. $600. Grace, eight, $500. Hagar, six, $300. Edward, three, $300. And then he goes on and lists the others, all of the others. But this certainly is, this is Edmund's family, oops, sorry. <laughs> this is Edmund's family for sure, okay. Okay, uh, we looked at the slave schedule, schedule 1860 slave schedule. We found people there that matched, you know, the, that would match the ages of uh, Edmund's family. We found them in 1850 as well. I'm not gonna go through that, just show you that. We did look at the 1850, in 1860, and we looked at the 1840 to find Edmund in uh, Leon County. I mean, not Edmund, but Galvin in Leon County. All right, so we have we have Shakespeare's and other records. I'm not showing you those records, but we found him and Abram in Leon on Leon County tax rolls in the 1870s at the at the uh, state archives, Florida State Archives here in Le in Tallahassee. We found death notices, social activities, political and educational news in the Tallahassee Sentinel, Tallahassee Semi-Weekly. Uh, so in other words, in local newspapers, they were in the, they were in the papers in 1870s, 1880s. We found them in city directories in 1894 for the city of Tallahassee. Two had moved to, into the city. Uh, one of the daughters, Gracie, bought property in, in the city on Bruno, uh, uh, on I think on Bruno Street. Uh, what's interesting about the city directory is that it had, one of them had the religion and Gracie was listed as missionary Baptist. Also, one of them had her occupation and she was a cigar maker. Tobacco was very prominent um, in uh, Gaston County, the county next door. And so uh, there were two, two female family members that were cigar makers in the early 20th century in Tallahassee. Now we found them in another record, a publication. Uh, they, Edmund, a friend and a son, his grandson, were caught in one of the worst hurricanes to hit Florida between the Civil War and 1900. Uh, they were fishing uh, it, near here, near here, near near uh, Bel Air, in a place called Shell Point, and they tried to take cover in a little shed there by the sea. And people encouraged them to to uh, uh, go for cover elsewhere, but they stayed, and uh, they were caught in the storm. Uh, one of the friends, one of Edmund's friends could not swim. Um, he drowned and a grandson also drowned in that hurricane of 1873. One of the greatest storms in the history of uh, Leon County up until the 1900s. And so you find, you don't know where you will find people, what records you will find. And so we're putting it all together now. So what, what do we know? We know that Edmund Shakespeare was born in slavery around 1818 in South Carolina to unknown parents. From the records we discovered, he had at least one sibling, Amy Wright. She said she was born in Augusta. He may have come, been born in Augusta too and was brought up in Barnwell District. So if we do future research, we know where to target our interests in Barnwell County 
and the Galfins and the McKinneys there. Edmund most likely was married three times. Uh, Jane, I think he may have married before Jane or may have had a partner before Jane because of the age of some of the children. And she was only 30 when we saw on that rations roll. So I think she may have, he may have married someone before. He was much older. Um, Edmund the, the, was identified as the, um, Jane was identified as the mother of his eight children. I'm not quite sure about that, but they mentioned Jane and Clarissa as their parents. Uh, on November, uh, well, he, Edmund, um, Jane may have died before, uh, shortly after uh, 1866, the ra may have died before 1866 because she was not listed on the rations Rachel was. So Rachel married um, Edmund in December 1865. By law, all enslaved persons had to marry by a certain time. And so Reverend James Page married uh, most of the people in Bel Air and maybe in Leon County uh, during that period. And then on November 14th, 1873, he married Cl Clarissa, but we saw some record where Clarissa was listed as his wife in 1870, so I'm not sure about that. Emma died in test state on June, July 16, 1890 in Bel Air. And we have probate records on him. I didn't go through the probate records, but we have this, we have the probate record, records for him. We know that uh, until May 20th, Edmund was a bond servant of Dr. George Galson. Um, just recapping here, we know in 1866, he bought 10 acres of land for $250. We know that by 1870, he was active in the Republican Party. He had a master of personal property. My time is almost up, so let me just run through this. Um, uh, Edmund Shakespeare died in Bel Air in 1890. He's most likely buried in the Bel Air Cemetery. Reverend James Page most likely presided at his funeral. And um, some, some I said that because some records show that at least one person in his family was missionary Baptist and he was the pastor of Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church in Bel Air. Putting it all together, uh, researching African Americans can be challenging, but having a famous surname may make it easier. This presentation focused on the Shakespeare family of Tallahassee, Florida. As you may recall, the eldest family member knew very little about the ancestors, her ancestors and relatives. She had no relatives to interview, no family documents, and she had very little information to begin to begin to begin her research. Okay, so we use all of these records. We found them over time, and we pieced together a piece together the story of um, the Shakespeare family. Uh, one of the first records that helped me get started was the Social Security Claims Index for Gracie Shakespeare because it listed the father and it listed the name of the mother. And then I was able to find the family in census records dating from 1950 all the way back to 1870. And, and also in Florida state census records, I found the family and reconstructed the family. Okay. So I want to leave you with the, these thoughts here is that whether you know a great deal about your family or you know very little about your family, Conducting a reasonably exhaustive research, you most likely will be able to extend at least one of your branches into slavery. The tips are here in researching your family, start with yourself and work backwards. Don't rush. Don't skip generations. Be persistent. Ask for help. And you will be amazed at what you find. Uh, word from Dr. Gates. Um, so eloquently stated, tracing one family tree won't solve all the problems facing Black America. This is sort of knowledge about one's past most certainly can help to brown our people in the very best that the African American tradition has achieved. The fundamental principles that enable our people not only to endure, but to rise and thrive. With that note, I want to thank you for listening, attending the presentation today, and I am open uh, to questions.
You do have a number of questions. What an amazing presentation. And I mean, that is that is a case study. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was over a, year, over a year, about two years, really. Okay. And, uh, just finding bits and pieces and then putting them all together, you know, put them in a folder and then coming back and figuring out where they belong. So I love this story. <laughs> yeah. And you know, somebody did ask, when did you start researching this? And why this family? 2016. Okay. 2015. 2015. Uh, right. 2015. And I started this, uh, why this family? Because it was such an interesting name. We were in a, when our genealogy club meetings and and my friend said she wanted to find out about her family about Shakespeare and uh, so I was just starting my practice I just retired so I had nothing else to do and so I just started going to the state archives talking to people and the more and more people I talked to they had they had heard the names and uh, so I want to encourage people to go to talk to people at the state archives in the library yeah. because a lot yeah. of even if they don't work there, they might be there collecting information and they know they know they come across the records. So so I got involved because of the name, the Shakespeare name. And then I thought it would be a really interesting story. And um, I was just amazed really at how much information was out there. You know, just the ton, every record you can think of they're in, which was amazing to me. And I'll tell you what broke my heart though. This was, uh, I was just starting out as a researcher. And when I read the um, will of George Galpin, after I had read all of the information about how they were asking affectionately about Mama Amy, and she said, hello, and Uncle Edmund said this, and he's taking care of this. And what he said in the will, and this was my first case of this, it said, if they act up in the will, if they act up, I leave them to such and such and such. But if they act up, sell them. Uh -huh. That was my first case. That was my first case. It's like, I'm, yeah. I'm telling everybody, I can't believe it. If it. But now I'm immune to it, you know? It's, yeah. yeah. It's just the record. But uh, that was really, uh, that really moved me. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, regarding that name, though, Shakespeare, somebody had asked, it was a possible that the surname Shakespeare came from Edmund, who you said he could read. Yes. Uh, maybe he was exposed to some of the writings of a certain famous English playwright and selected that name. I mean, it, it may be, it may be. Um, I don't know. I thought about that because he was fond of John Maxwell Galfin, who was in school at some school in Georgia. I forget mm -hmm. the name of it. But but he was very he was very close to the children, so he may have they may have taught him how to read, and they may have been reading some Shakespeare. Who knows? Or maybe it's a family name. I don't know. You know, maybe it's a family name. There are some Shakespeare's I think in South Carolina. I think I saw some, and the family is originally from South Carolina. So maybe it's maybe it's a family name. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe it could be an adopted name. Yeah. But certainly certainly he did not adopt the name of the enslaver. You know, and, and there were no Shakespeare's listed in Leon County in the 1860 census, hmm. in the 1870 census, only in 1870, only Edmund in his family. Yeah, hmm. no Shakespeare lived near him in the yeah. census. None were there, in fact. Right. So we have one last question. And this person was asking, is Max, M-A-X, and Mac one of the same? Yes, I think. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're the same. James right. Maxwell Galpin, uh, the son and executor of uh, George Galpin's will. Yeah. And he was the one who sold the property to Edmund in 1866 for $250. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and he later... Um, bought a mule from Edmund on credit. Yeah, because I think that just highlights how the fortunes were lost yeah. uh, during the after the Civil War. Yeah. And this eventually moved to um they moved to Jacksonville and other points. And mm -hmm. Bel Air, which was which was uh initially um a wealthy resort, then after the Civil War became mostly a, a, an all black area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have the evidence that you had all these planters there now by the name of the streets that are there. Mm. So this is a very rich story. I love the story. <laughs>
Well, thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, I actually don't see any more questions. Uh, most people, it's always interesting when we do one of these presentations and it's a case study as rich as yours, people are quiet because they are just tuned in. It's great. Well, thank you for, for joining us, Dr. Gaston, and thank all of you for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, you know, her email is on the slide, but it's also in the handout. If you were having issues downloading the handout for any reason, feel free to send us an email. It is genealogy at acpl.info, which I'll put that in the chat. All right. Well, I hope all of you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Bye. you so much. I really enjoyed uh, presenting, and I hope that people benefited from my presentation. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.